Myra Brooks Welch penned these words, and they are absolutely wonderful. This piece is entitled, The Touch of the Master's Hand. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it barely worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people, he cried, who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar do I hear two, two, who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no. From the room far back, a gray-bearded man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, What am I now bid? For this old violin, as he held it aloft with its bow. One thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who makes it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going, going, gone, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried. We just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply. The touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once, he is going twice, he is going almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. This month we're talking about how God changes lives. And I'm reminded throughout Scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation of how God changes lives. It's interesting, by the way, to notice that when God changes lives, have you noticed He also often changes names? Abram became Abraham, Jacob became Israel. There are other examples like that in Scripture. By the way, in the New Testament, Saul became Paul. And for those in our Sunday school class this morning, Abby, Paul wrote how many letters in the New Testament? At least 13. There's one that's kind of up for grabs, but at least 13. What a difference that one man made. This morning we're going to talk about one of those changed lives, and he received a new name. We begin in Scripture to know him as Simon, but he became known as Peter. Two passages of Scripture this morning. The first one is in John chapter 1, where he actually receives his new name there. Later we'll turn to Luke chapter 5, and we'll study some there as well. John chapter 1, we'll begin reading with verse 35. Scripture says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Can I ask you this this morning? Who was it that first taught you about Jesus? Many of us, hands would raise up in the air quickly, and our parents, how many would join me in that? Our parents were first primary teachers, ones that taught us about Jesus. But perhaps there's also someone that cared for you, that cared about you. It may have been that special Sunday school teacher, 
the one that taught you the gospel message, that would be Miss Pope for me. May have been the one that when I was earlier taught me to put my hands together to pray, that would be Miss Mary Lou that taught me that. But my parents were the first primary teachers for me. Now let me ask you this, because this is one, we may not know the answer to this. Do you know the person that taught you about Jesus, do you know who taught them about Jesus? I am most blessed because I have the answer to that question. My parents became Christians as adults. And there was a preacher in Pensacola, Florida that first introduced my mom to Jesus, but when she moved back to Greenville following the death of her husband and she met daddy and they got married, they decided we need to go to church. Well, where will we go to church? Well, we're going to go to the Church of Christ over there behind the bank because I know that Mama said when I was in Pensacola, that Church of Christ preacher sure was kind to me and reached out to me at an important time in my life. And so it was there that God's providence in His hand was all over that matter because my mom and dad met a man by the name of Stanley Maiden who was preacher at the church at the time. Mr. Stanley grew up in England and he had that accent and it was just beautiful. It brings just, uh, just uh, chills to you the minute that I think of that and I think about the lessons that he presented, but not just the lessons. It was the time that he spent with my daddy at the coffee shop. It was the time he spent with my parents in the living room of their home talking to them about Jesus and they became Christians as a result of the time that he spent with them. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do. I hope that you know those and have that list of those who have taught you about Jesus. But if you happen to know those who taught them about Jesus, do this, it's not on your outline, but write some of those names down in the corner. And make sure you do this, that when you have opportunity to approach God in prayer later today, will you do this? Thank God for them, not just for your parents, but for the fact that they taught you about Jesus. And not just the ones who taught you about Jesus, but the ones who taught them. Because you see, we have an opportunity to carry on that message. And I can't think of a better compliment that at some point somebody would be asked in a very similar situation, who was it that taught you about Jesus? And what if they wrote our name down on that list? But if we were to ask Peter, Peter, who taught you about Jesus? Oh, well, Andrew is the one who brought me to Jesus. Well, Andrew, how did you find out about Jesus? I was with John the Baptist, and he pointed me to Jesus. If you look at this story in John chapter 1, the interaction with Jesus and Simon is actually very brief. But there are a couple of things that we notice in that passage that I think are really important for us. Uh, two statements. You are, and you will become. You are, and you will become. You are Cephas, you will be called I'm sorry, you are Simon, you will be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. But he looks at him and he says, here's who you are. And I think about that because the application to that is just so great. That when the Lord looks at us, he knows who we are. But he doesn't just know who we are, he knows who we can become. But let there be no doubt, church, it's not just who we are and who we can become. It's who makes the difference. Who was it that gave Simon, his new name. Jesus. Who was it that made the difference in Simon's life? Jesus. Who gave him the courage and the words that would say, that would ultimately make that difference when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and delivered that great message? Now again, you talk about there's at least 3,000 people that day that who taught you about Jesus? Well, Peter taught me about Jesus. Who taught Peter about Jesus? Well, Andrew brought me to Jesus. Andrew who brought... Do you see the, just how beautiful that story becomes? It's people that point other people to Jesus. And while it is so easy for us today to talk about the ones who have brought us to Jesus, church, I'm concerned and I'm challenged. Are we bringing other people to Jesus? There's a phrase that I'm using now, and I hope that it will be understood correctly. 
Because I'm looking at things today and I'm asking questions. I'm reviewing things that we do as a church so that I can bring this up in conversation to us. Because ultimately the answer to that is, are we impacting others for Jesus? Is it presenting opportunities for us to plant seeds so that the church can grow? And more and more I'm growing concerned because we can tell who those people are that influenced us for Christ, but we aren't even recognizing the opportunities that before us to impact others for Christ. Church, we are given opportunity day after day after day after day to tell other people about Jesus, to influence others for Christ. And what I fear is, is we're missing the opportunities. We're letting them pass us by. And you know, the thing that concerns me even more is I'm not sure that it bothers us yet. I mean, seriously. Does it bother us that there are people around us who don't know Jesus? Now I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. One thing that I think of is how many of us are quick, and we need to do this, don't get this part wrong. How many of us are quick to call and to ask someone else, will you pray for so-and-so because they are physically ill? But I'm going to tell you where we're missing the boat, church. We need to be meeting physical needs and we need to be praying about physical needs. But there are people whose souls are lost and that needs to have a place of primary importance to us as we approach the Lord in prayer and as we determine what we're going to do day after day. We need to be influencing others for the cause of Christ. Because the pages of Scripture are filled with those times of where we talk to others about Jesus. People were pointing others to Christ. Now, let's turn to Luke chapter 5. This is really interesting to me in this study for this particular lesson. One of the things that I found interesting, John chapter 1, Luke chapter 5, you read them independently, and it's really hard to tell of which event took place first. But most scholars agree that it happened in the order of John 1, then Luke 5. There's disagreement over how much time span was involved between these two. But the order, they're pretty much in agreement on that. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 5. Scripture will tell us that they are at the Lake of Gennesaret, which is also known as church the Sea of Galilee. And so there at the Sea of Galilee, we know that Peter has been uh, fishing all night, he and his other buddies, and they have come in and they're washing their nets, but while they're there, Jesus shows up. Huge crowd is there and they're wanting to listen to Jesus. And so Jesus borrows Peter's boat and he stepped just a little bit out from shore so that he can speak and so that others can hear him. And so it really becomes just kind of a, a, a pulpit. It's a place, if you can picture, almost like an amphitheater so that Jesus could be heard. And so that's what's taken place up to this point. We're going to actually read the story from verse 4 through verse 11. So let's draw our attention to Luke chapter 5, verse 4. When he had finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let's let down the nets for a fish. Simon answered, Master, we work hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, for from now on you will fish for people. And so they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Man, Peter could have had some excuses, couldn't he? If you have ever worked so hard after a night like that, and, and have to remember, this, 
This was a livelihood for these men. He could have offered all kind of excuses of why he didn't want to go out into the deep water. He could have even offered excuses of why he wasn't about to go out into the deep water. But he did. You see, Peter accepted the words of Jesus. Now this goes a little deeper. Because when he goes out and Jesus says, let's go out into that deep water and catch the fish. And Peter could have responded, Lord, you need to understand this. You're a good preacher, don't get me wrong, but fishing, leave this up to me. Last night was an off night, I'll give you that. But if fish are going to be caught in this lake, they're going to be caught in the shallow part of the water, and they're going to be caught during the night, not the deep water during the day. But that's not what Peter said to him. Peter didn't really argue about it. The closest that he came to any excuse at all is, is he said, Lord, we've worked hard all night. We hadn't caught anything. Well, that's kind of a statement of fact, wasn't it? Everybody could look around and they could see there's no fish there. They're just watching the nets, which was necessary, by the way, so that the nets wouldn't rot. And so they've gone out and, and so here the nets are. What does Peter say? He accepts what the Lord said. He said, Lord, we've worked hard all night. We hadn't caught anything, but he accepted his message but because you say so. And church, sometimes we don't need to argue with the Lord about what His Word is. We just need to read it and we need to simply respond to that by saying, because you say so. There are things that Scripture teaches us to do that at times can be real easy for us to want to argue about, to offer excuses about. But church, we need to accept those messages as true. Because you say so. Because Scripture says so. But it goes even beyond that. It's one thing to say, that's right, that's exactly what Scripture says. Peter didn't say just that. He said, because you say so, I'll let down my nets. And then what did he do? He put his hand on those oars and he went out into the deep water. He took those nets and he threw them off to the side. And then he began to pull them back in. He didn't just accept what Jesus had to say. He obeyed what the Lord had told him to do. Again, there's opportunity for us to remember that we don't need to just sit here and argue with the Lord of excuses of why we don't want to do something. It's one thing to come to terms with it, but ultimately the question is this. Are we doing something about it? Are we obeying what the Lord tells us to do? Because Peter did that. This next part's really important, by the way. So Peter starts pulling on those nets. I don't know when. I, I, I've been real honest. Mr. Burton and I spent a lot of time talking about this, and I don't know how to net fish. I barely know how to cane pole fish. But I do know this, that net he started pulling, and at some point, I've got in my mind that the water begins to churn. At some point, you see the first fish. And at some point, you begin to see that it's a lot of fish. And the fish start to roll over in the boat. And here's the part that I almost missed. What did Peter do next? Because see, here's what I've always done. Those fish begin to come in, they're filling up the boat, and Peter drops to his knees and he says, Lord, go away from me, for I'm a sinful man. And that part happens, but I almost missed the good stuff. That's not the first thing Peter did, is it? He called his fishing buddies. Because this was about to be an effort of teamwork. He called his buddies, and if you'll notice, both boats began to fill. That's when Peter dropped to his knees and said, Lord, go away from me for our sinful man. And if you will notice the wording in the remainder of that passage, if you will notice, Scripture says that for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And he names James and John, the son of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. Verse 11. And so they pulled up their boats on shore left everything and followed him. John chapter 1, Andrew led Peter to Jesus. Luke chapter 5, 
Peter leads the others to Jesus. Isn't that great? That's wonderful for me to see. Because together they all recognize. Now Peter is the one that takes center stage in the story. But let there be no doubt. It was all of them that left that day and followed Jesus. Later Peter might talk about it and he says, uh, Lord, we've all left everything to follow you. Peter's the one that's talking, but he's speaking in reference to that same group. What a powerful message because that day, Peter brought others with him. And so church, we need to understand when we take opportunity to follow Jesus, to do the right thing even when it's most difficult, when we set that example and set that influence for others, others will watch. And it's our opportunity to lead others to Jesus. Now if we were to look at this story of Peter, we don't have this full understanding of who he was. But Peter told us who he was. He said, I'm a sinful man. Peter was honest about who he was. And it was the Lord who took Peter from the point of being a broken man, a sinful man, and gave him a new mission in life. I will make you a fisher of men. And the same thing that the Lord did for Peter that day, He desires to do for us. You know, there are a lot of modern day examples really that speak the same thing, the same kind of difference that Jesus has made in the lives of others. One of those is an old boy by the name of Clyde. Clyde's father was a Bible salesman. And as Clyde was growing up, their whole family went to church until Clyde was old enough that he didn't have to go with them. And when he didn't have to go with them, he decided he was going to stay home. He didn't want anything to do with church. And he spent most Sundays going off and hunting. One particular Sunday when he was out hunting with a group of men, something happened, and nobody really knows what happened, but he got in a disagreement with these two guys and he killed both of them. And at the age of 17... Clyde became one of the youngest men ever on death row in the state of Texas. This was back in about 1929. And so while he was in prison, he had his rough spots until he started listening to this radio preacher. And he heard it, reminded him of things he had been taught when he was younger, and he decided he wanted to become a Christian. And so the story as I read it was is that this radio preacher even came and baptized him into Christ. But you know, sometimes situations are tough, and in Clyde's case, he fell away. In fact, there was a point where a group of them wanted to escape, and Clyde was part of that group. That group tried to escape. Clyde was recaptured, but there were a couple others that were killed during that time. Clyde brought back in. Then he gets in a fight with a couple of guys in prison and he kills two more people. And so now he's killed four people. He became so bad. He, was, he, he had this reputation that he was now known as the meanest man in the state of Texas. They put him in isolation in this prison. In fact, it was at one point the old prison morgue and they put him in there and they closed that door and there was only one small part of that door that was open every day and that was to put meals in and out. He asked for a Bible because he figured that's the one book that they'd let him read. But there was something different about reading that Bible this time. Now he started paying attention to things that he had missed when he was younger even things that he had missed when he became a Christian. And so he took advantage of this opportunity to make things right with the Lord and not just to accept it, but to obey it and to share it. Guards in their limited contact with him noticed the change and there was a point where he was put back out in the population of death row inmates and even a point where he was put out in general population. But boy, it became very obvious that he had made a difference. Something had happened in that isolation cell. And so now he's sharing the gospel with other people. 
In fact, eight other prisoners were baptized into Christ because Clyde taught them about Jesus. Prison system as it was in that day and time, there was a point where he was actually released on parole. And so the first thing he did, he went to the Lubbock County Jail because he understood that to be one of the largest jails in the state of Texas. He went there and he volunteered to be part of a prison ministry there where he went and taught other people about Jesus. And the great thing about that story is it was sometime later that Clyde passed away. But can you imagine the change in the way that he was talked about when he passed away? At one time he'd been known as the meanest man in the state of Texas. But instead he went down as one of the greatest soul winners in the state of Texas in his generation. Now church, I've got to tell you, if, if he'll make that kind of change, and the Lord will do that kind of good with him. What do you think the Lord could do with some of us that would get a little serious about accepting the message of Jesus, obeying it, and then sharing it? Because we have had things so good. We've had others. We all have in our mind those that shared Jesus with us. We give thanks to God for that. But let there be no doubt, church, there's a point where we have got to take this message and we've got to do something with it. You know, you look at people and as they go through struggles in life and perhaps some addiction program, what is the point where they can tell that that person has gone from addiction and has now found freedom? What is the ultimate thing that people look for, those counselors look for? It's the time when you start helping someone else. Old friend of mine that had gone through drug rehab, I knew that he was going to make it when I watched him put not one but two other people into drug rehab, that he met with them and he got them there and he helped get them help. That's when it became obvious. That's when we will tell for us of where Jesus really means something to us. It's not just acknowledging what he has done for us. All that does is it makes us takers. Thank you for teaching me about Jesus. Thank you for teaching me about Jesus. But the whole point of the gospel, the point of a changed gospel, a changed life for us, is that we receive it, we obey it, and then we share it. And so today we leave with that very possibility before us. That opportunity before us to do something great, saying, here am I, send me. Lord, here am I. I desire for you to work in my life, work through my life. Father, fix my mess because we know that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And He mends their hearts. That's Psalm 147, verse 3. Today, He wants to do that if we have need for cleansing of the sin in our life. We find that forgiveness in baptism. But church, let there be no doubt, there is an invitation for all of us today. If you've not come to Jesus, but for those of us that have, the big test for us will be, what do we do when we walk out these doors? What do we do with the opportunities placed before us? I pray we make a difference in the lives of others and that one day someone will say, thank God for you for sharing with me the message of Jesus.